Hey everyone, welcome to our small footprint. My name is Nissa, and if you're new here, we are a family of eight who live off grid in Australia. Uh, we this video is another of the food prep and planning videos uh, for the March April supply run time period. Uh, so this is still in March, I think. Uh, we the timeline it got a little skewed by the construction of the new buildings and then the an Easter weekend and things like that. So the most recent video that I put out was a was one of the food prep videos and this is the follow on to it. I'm out in the new structure again. It is still raining, uh, so everything is wet and washing isn't getting done and it's cooler temperatures and yeah anyway uh, I did get a question about the breezeway and the lack of doors in the in the um, new rooms from Karen and I just thought I'd clarify that that this breezeway will eventually be sealed off so the plan eventually is to put in within the next few weeks to put framing both ends of this and then in winter it can be sealed uh, completely for the moment and then as summer comes along we're going to use some screens and stuff uh, Robin who lives in Toowoomba has some screen doors and screens from windows and stuff like that that they are getting replaced with some new stuff and they said we could have the old ones so that was really really lovely of them and it means that we can use them in the framing for it well also at that end of the framing there will be a small wood stove because the problem is that there's only a wood stove in that space there so it won't heat these bedrooms uh, not enough anyway and we do get down to negative five to negative eight overnight here during winter not for a very long period of time but long enough that it still needs to be warmed up so eventually both ends of the breezeway will be sealed in such a way that they will have uh, screening or metal or whatever. I'd like to keep them as open as possible for airflow and lighting, uh, but for this season we'll do what we can and sort it out. We are looking at buying a framing gun in... I just had to pause the camera. The... It, on the screen it looks like everything is really fuzzy and I think it might be a temperature change from where I've changed the camera so I'm gonna stop for a second try and correct that before I come back all right that seems better I've cleaned up with an alcohol wipe and changed the battery even though I don't know why that would be causing fuzzy but it looks better on my screen so hopefully that's worked uh, what was I saying yes next time we go into Toowoomba we're planning on getting a framing gun which will make framing up these ends easier before we do the ends that we need to remove all the metal cladding from this wall here before we can seal up the end so that's the process anyway so I just thought I'd clarify that in case I haven't because uh, Karen had mentioned that uh, why are we not putting doors on our bedrooms because we'll get bugs and stuff in there the whole point is that this will all be one big space the whole house will be enclosed uh, and we can open up that wall have everything moved around Daryl and I will probably put our office out here so uh yeah anyway i just thought i'd clarify that so back to the food so this is the next few days leading on from the last video uh and food prep from the march april uh food and it crosses three or four days again that's how they've tended to work out these days unless there's something big on uh in the middle like something that i've made is significant then they tend to cover across three or four days at the moment i think it's change of weather easter the construction things like that that's just how it works so i'll get into the voiceover and i'll see you at the end so at this point, I'm still working through all the limes and lemons that I got. There was some huge clearance boxes and I really don't want to let any go to waste if I can avoid it because I use a fair bit of lime and lemon juice and it's quite expensive to buy. Though you still have to use bottled juices in a lot of your preserves and stuff because you want that maintained consistent pH in that. So I still buy it for that purpose. But for cooking and that, using fresh stuff is much nicer. Uh, the limes were super cheap. They were already bagged up into netting bags and they were already starting to head on their way out, which is why they were cheap. I think I got the box for like five dollars and I want to say there was like 15 kilos of limes in there a lot of them are starting to yellow and I did have to discard some that had some fuzzies growing on them but the a lot most of them were still perfectly usable in a lot of ways I didn't zest a lot of them because the skins were just not that great at this point uh, but I was happy to juice them I did keep some of the nice dark green ones aside as I went because they have good clean skin and I can use them for other purposes not just juicing but the majority of the yellowing ones I just used for juice and then we'll just discard the rest of it 
as I would fill a jug with the juice and this is just that Kmart cheapy juicer that will eventually go out on me I'm sure but for now it's working uh, a viewer did send me the attachment for the KitchenAid the juicing attachment for the KitchenAid which is great it works really well it's got nice power to it and everything but it's sort of vertical and the angle that it needs to be used on the I don't know if you're going to hear that thumping in the background, but Carvick got his stitches out yesterday and he's hopping. And all I can hear while I'm standing here is the thumping as he's hopping around the house. And I don't know if it's going to come through on the, on the voiceover, but if it does, I apologize. Anyway, uh, the KitchenAid one is kind of vertical and you have to hold the uh lemons and stuff against it and at the height that my bench is and the KitchenAid is it just didn't work Sonnet was unable to get any pressure behind it uh, and for me it was a lot of effort to get that pressure behind it I think if I could put the KitchenAid on a lower bench for that sort of purpose then it would work really well so it's just boxed up in the cupboard for the moment and this Kmart one is working fairly well I filled ice trays of various sizes, taking note approximately how many mils goes into each size of these cavities. The larger Kmart silicon baking trays are quite good. They hold a solid amount, and because they're a shallower cube than the big square cubed ones, which hold much the same quantity, uh, they defrost a little faster. They work great for all sorts of pureed fruits and juices and all sorts of things like that. Uh, they, I've been meaning to grab a few more. The only issue is the lack of lids on them. So when you're putting them in the freezer, that makes a bit of a difference. If they had lids, you could stack them, but without lids, you have to have them all flat. So you have to have the space in the freezer for that. And this is what I use my upright freezer a lot for because it has shelves, is trays of things that need to be flash frozen, especially things that are going to topple. Fruits and stuff aren't such a big deal because if they're on an angle, they're still going to freeze. But when you've got liquid, then you need that flat. So we use that for all our ice trays and stuff as well. Uh, Amazon does have the ice cube like the soup cubes and stuff the silicon ones and they have lids and they look fantastic and I've got them on my list but they're a lot more expensive and I don't know whether the the benefits of the lid really compensates for the massive increase in price uh, but I do have some on my list and I might buy some at some point to give them a go and see how I feel about whether it's it's worth that extra dollar value or not I then moved on to making some cordial now the other day I had zested and peeled some whole limes. So I had about 12 whole limes, which I suppose equates to about 240 to 360 mils of juice. If you count a lime as having about 20 to 30 mils of juice per. And I will try it with straight juice next time because I didn't keep any more whole limes. Uh, I split and cut up a vanilla bean as well. One of my favorite alcoholic drinks is a lemonade with vanilla vodka and a slice of lime squeezed and muddled. I don't drink alcohol much and I do have some vanilla vodka sitting on the shelf, but I don't generally buy lemonade anymore either. Now at one point, because I like the flavors of that, but I don't drink a whole lot of alcohol and alcohol is expensive. I tried just lemonade with a dash of liquid vanilla and the lime pieces and it worked quite well. No alcohol, but similar flavor. But again, I don't buy lemonade anymore either. So it's not something that I have either. So I had a thought, what if I made a lime cordial, which is fairly heavily sweetened because it would have to be to be cordial because lime is tart and put a vanilla bean in it. I might be able to make lime vanilla cordial to use with my soda water. So I put a generous amount of water in the pot with the 12 limes. I am going to have to go back and figure out how much water this was because I don't know what size this pan is, but it ended up being about half the pan. So if I measure that out again, I'll have the literage and I'll, we'll come back if I can and try and put that here or I'll make it again and then I'll make a note then because this is the first time I've ever made it. I put the split and cut vanilla pod in there and brought it all up to a simmer. I did use my Hackett, the meat breaker upper thing, to break up the whole limes as well. I could have just cut them, but by leaving them whole, I wasn't losing any juice on the board or anything. So I thought I'd just stick them whole in the pot and then break them up when they're in the pot. While that was simmering, I went back to the limes I had and sliced the really nice dark ones with the really clean skin. Uh, into really thin slices. I filled a tray to freeze just like this. Sometimes I like having those frozen slices with the pith and everything still attached because as much as the pith can be bitter, it still has this flavor profile to it for certain things. So I like to have some frozen slices of whole fruit as well. And then I have all the different types in the freezer to use however I want and in frozen in different bags with different types. So if I want a piece of lime that has skin and pith and everything on it, I can use that. Or if I want just juice on its own, I can use that. Or if I want just zest on its own, again, I can use that. If I have those options in the freezer, it gives me those options to use. 
after the comma or after the cordial had simmered for a while I used the rounded end of the hackett to sort of push the limes through a slotted spoon just getting another set making sure that it's all you know getting as much juice and flavor out of them as possible now most of the time I would strain this before adding sugar but I decided that I wanted to steep it longer with the sugar in there with those pieces of lime and those vanilla beans uh, get all the flavor out of the flesh and, and that sort of thing. So I added a handful of zest just to give it a further burst of flavor and then added the sugar. I ended up adding about 1.5 kilos of sugar to this mix and then tasting it. This is a lot higher sugar ratio than I would normally use in our cordials. But normally a fruit has its own sweetness. Lime does not have its own sweetness to add to the cordial. So we have to add the sugar to make that sweetness. Uh, so and because we're trying to mimic sort of the lemonade with lime, lemonade is very sweet. Obviously, we're not going to take it that far, but it's still a sweet drink. So it, about 1.5 kilos of sugar is what I ended up adding to this and giving it a try. I did taste it then. Uh, cordials need to taste sweeter and stronger now than what it's going to taste later, obviously, because you're diluting it. But the sugar also tends to tone down a real lot once it's canned and then added to your soda water. Uh, I suppose the the saltiness of soda water, it's not salt, but it has that salty flavor to it. It tends to counteract your, your sweetness as well. So you want to make sure that it's a lot stronger tasting now than how you're going to want to taste it once you've diluted it. I brought it to a simmer, dissolving all the sugar. Uh, you want to make sure that all the sugar is dissolved so that you don't have any crystallization problems later. Uh, put the lid on it and set it aside to steep for longer. I did add some tartaric acid, I believe, but not citric because obviously it's limes. Uh, tartaric acid can help with fermentation issues. It probably didn't need it, but I tend to add it just as a an in-case sort of a thing. It doesn't really change the flavor at all. Uh, and sometimes it helps get the, the color, the citric acids and the, the tartaric acids help to make the color more vibrant. So sometimes it's a nice way to use them for, for that purpose anyway. Then I put the lid on it and I set it aside to steep for longer. Probably overnight it'll get moved to the fridge once it's cold. I then made a fresh jar of lemon chung. Now uh, there are a few different methods to make this. You need to clean your lemons with bicarb like when you're making the fermented lemons and then you need to cut the knobbly bits off and slice it and remove the seeds. Uh, the seeds can cause some bitterness in the syrup so you want to make sure that you remove all the seeds as you slice it. It's really not that much of an issue because you're slicing it so thin that the seeds are right there and easy to see. Here's where things can be different in the methods that are made. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of the recipes say that you put all the slices in a bowl and then you put the sugar with it and you mix it all up, letting some of the juice extract and dissolve some of the sugar before putting it in the jars. Now, yes, theoretically, this disperses the sugar more evenly, uh, but when I did it, it was a real mess then trying to get those slices into the jars. It just, it was wasn't real fun <laughs> trying to move those slimy sugar covered slices of lemon into a jar without making a mess without losing any of it without dirtying the rim of the jar too much and things like that I didn't find it particularly practical but that is how most recipes tell you to do it you want the same weight of sugar as lemons and this is fairly important because I have been slack with measuring the sugar before and ended up with like a fizzy fermented lemon syrup by accident so you do want to make sure that your sugar to to uh, lemon ratio is correct uh, and what I tend to do is I tend to layer it in the jar instead of mixing it first. So a bit like how I make the fermented lemons, I place slices of lemon in the jar and put sugar and slices of lemon and put sugar and making sure that I'm using the correct amount of sugar for the amount of lemons that I'm using uh, and then just layer it through the jar. Now, it will still do the same thing. It still, it still extracts the lemon juice from the lemon slices and it still fills the jar with the lemon juice. You do sometimes get a little bit more solid sugar layers in it though that have it, that take a bit longer to disperse than when you mix it all through the lemon. But you're going to leave it on your bench for three days anyway. So all I do is I layer it all in and I top it all up. If you haven't got enough juice at the top, you can put some extra juice in there. But I do suggest waiting because it does extract more juice the longer it sits. And once it 
and if you add too much extra juice, you can find that it overflows. So at least give it sort of 12, 24 hours before you look at topping up that juice, I reckon. Uh, and then what you're going to do, be, especially if it's layered like this, is you're going to tip it upside down numerous times. And I think you do that even if you did it the other way, but it's a little bit more important this if you've layered it in. So you've got a nice firm fitting lid and you leave it on your bench for about three days before it's ready as such, but basically for as long as it takes for all that sugar to dissolve. And then you tip the jar upside down and let all the liquid and the sugar sort of drip down and then tip it up the other way and it will all eventually disperse through and all you'll have is liquid with lemon slices. Uh, so the the rule of thumb is that you it takes about three days on your bench to do that and then once it's done that you can seal it off and put it on the shelf and then once you open that jar you then refrigerate it. Now I don't do a lot of products like that for a start sterilizing jars is a little more challenging in my environment uh, than a lot of others because my kitchen just isn't particularly adequate for completely sterile jars which is why I process everything because you don't have to sterilize your jars if you process it so so long as a processing time is more than 10 minutes you don't have to sterilize your jars for jam or anything like that uh, this is new guidelines so something like this you can store on a shelf and once it's open you can store it in your fridge but for me uh, our shelves are exposed we don't have cold rooms or cellars or anything else in winter it can get down to negative five negative eight celsius and in summer it can get up to about 48 celsius so those fluctuations are limited to a degree because it's still under a roof but uh, they get, it gets pretty hot so and pretty cold. So I don't leave anything on my shelf that isn't processed because if it pops open, it's going to make a mess and the food is going to be wasted. So I store mine in the fridge right from the word go. I also do it in these really big jars. If I was storing it on the shelf and then had to be refrigerated once it opened, I'd probably do it in smaller jars. Those 300 ml jam jars would probably work really well. And maybe I'll give that a go next time. Maybe I might even try processing them for 10 minutes before putting them on the shelf and see what that does to the flavor. Don't know. We'll, I might. I might experiment with that if I get another really big batch of lemons because I've got heaps of lemon juice and stuff in the freezer now. So I might have more lemons to experiment with then. I kept on processing the lemons as well and freezing their juice much the same as I did with the limes. I'm going to have a really nice little stash. Uh, it's amazing. We bought that 500 litre hybrid freezer thinking it would be so much space. And in reality, I had not frozen so many things because we didn't have the space. And then once I did have the space, I started freezing those things that I would have liked to have frozen before and didn't. And we filled it really quick. Uh, so I think that eventually we'll need a second one. But they are about a thousand dollars each so it'll be a little while off uh, they are really good on power usage because they're a hybrid model and they're five star so we can run another one but space is the issue as well so we kind of need to get the kitchen space sorted first before we have anywhere to put another one anyway because we already have one that we use as a fridge and one that we use as a freezer and they take up a fair bit of room because they're 500 liter chest freezers so but I definitely think another one is on the cards especially because we're uh, figuring out our hatching and processing of our roosters as well so the plan is to do a couple of hatches each year and process all the roosters from those hatches and get them in the freezer uh, at a couple of times a year which means it's going to be a bulk amount each of those times so once we do that we're going to need more space in the freezer as well to do that too then I just kept going, zesting and juicing the limes. I filled a quart jar with lime juice. I'm going to try and use that for more cordial if we like the current one. And then I filled ice trays with whatever else was left and got it in the freezer along with any zest that I had that needed to be frozen. The next day after the cordial mix had steeped overnight, I strained it. I used the finer metal strainer rather than the the big steel colander because there's a lot of small bits of lime pulp in there uh, which wouldn't be an issue if I'd used the juice only mind you so if I make one with juice only then straining it will be a whole lot easier but I wanted to give this a go with the whole limes uh, it did take a while to get it through that finer strainer though to manipulate the fresh the flesh around in the strainer to get the liquid through but I didn't want to push the flesh into the strainer either because I didn't really want that, those bits and pieces in the cordial either uh, so it took a bit of a bit of maneuvering so when I make one with the juice I'm going to compare the flavors and if it's juice only works just as well then we'll probably stick with that now this only filled four of my cordial jars 
It was a fairly small pot that I did it in because it was a bit of a test run. Uh, we definitely use less of this cordial than we do some of the fruit flavors that are lower in sugar and more fruity. This was definitely riding the you know, syrup versus cordial line. So it will last a bit longer per jar. It also has these lovely little black flecks all through it from the vanilla beans, which is kind of nice. Uh, but yeah, it didn't make a huge amount, so I am going to measure that water in the pot and see what my ratios were and try using the juice to make a bigger bulk batch instead of with that juice instead of the whole limes and the relevant water ratios once I figure it out. Uh, I do think I'm low on sugar this month though, so I might need to freeze that lime juice and wait until next month because I think I'm on my last bag of sugar for this month because we did a few bits and pieces that needed it, all that plum jam and things like that. Cleaned the rims of the jars as always with white vinegar, used a mix of new and old lids on the Posada jars, which are almost always my favorite type of jar for cordial. They hold a really good amount. I think it's a 780 ml jar. Uh, they have a nice narrow mouth and they look really pretty to boot. So, you know, I also bagged up all that lemon, all the lime pulp from the cordial for the freezer. This is really sweet and tangy after steeping and all that sugar. And I'm sure I can use it in something. Uh, I'm not sure what yet, but I'll figure something out. A dessert of some kind, lime, citrus, anything is a winner here. I do really want to make a vanilla slice. I haven't made one in a really long time. And I want to make a vanilla slice. I wonder if this would be really nice as the icing on a vanilla slice. So you've got that lime, sweet lime icing on top of the vanilla slice. We might give that a go. I steam canned the cordial in my pressure canner like I usually do, three quarts of water in the bottom, lid on until there's a steady stream of steam and the valve pops up and then starting the timer for 15 minutes, which is basically the time that I do anything here, jams and all that sort of stuff because we are above a thousand feet in altitude. Uh, I got a quick clip in here of when I was testing out that hot cross bun recipe. This was the first batch that I made and showed in that hot cross bun video. Uh, they were very good. I did use some of the lime zest that I had uh, done from those limes in these at the time as well. So that was just part of that day. Food has been a bit challenging this month. I'm not sure why. Change of season maybe, the new buildings. Uh, cooking has been something I've had to really put some effort into for meals. So I've been trying to make meals that carry over for the next day just to make life that little bit easier. Fried rice is one of those things for me that can be carried over a couple of meals. It can be on its own for dinner, with something else for breakfast, and sometimes even enough for a side for dinner the next night too. And depending what you serve it with and how you flavor it and things like that, it tastes different every meal. So it's just a very diverse dish for me and I make it fairly basic so that it can be used in those ways. The butcher had this traditional bacon on sale for $7.99 a kilo that I grabbed. It's basically big slabs of smoky ham pretty much uh, but it was cheap and that's still cheaper than ham so what I tend to do is I use the Thermomix to grate it up so its usability is a bit more versatile. So I cut each slab into a couple of chunks and then I just give it a few seconds on speed 5 in the Thermomix to let it shred up into fairly even shreds so I can use it in a variety of ways. So I did that in a couple of batches, two or three batches for that whole kilo. Uh, I put some in a pan to fry off and I bagged up the rest in the silicon bags to put in the fridge. I don't know if I show that anywhere, but if you watch the grocery haul, I got some of the decor flat bottom silicon bags half price to try. I'm not a fan. Uh, yes, the flat bottom makes them stand up, but it also means the mouth doesn't stay open and it has seams down the side that food gets stuck in and yeah, I'm kind of glad they only had one pack in stock, even at half price. I also had some of the grilled chicken that I had pulled out of the freezer, but it wasn't fully defrosted, so I decided to shred that up in the thermix as well. It would disperse more through the rice and was easier than trying to defrost it in the pan. So I mixed that through with the bacon and fried that off as well till the bacon was a little crispy and everything was defrosted and warmed through. I took that off the heat and then I scrambled a bunch of eggs in the pan as well. And then added the pre-cooked rice that I had. I cooked it same day. I know you're supposed to put it in the fridge overnight, but I haven't been planning ahead that much. So it was cooked a little bit earlier in the day. Absorption method left to dry and cool out a little bit. I basically just use my biggest stainless steel bowl that I have. I put the rice in, the chicken and the bacon, the scrambled eggs, a couple of tins of corn, any other veg or anything that I might have that would be easy to add. I pour a bit of soy sauce, oyster sauce, some sesame oil, and that's it. It's ready. It's very simple, but I really enjoy it. It's salty, flavorful, filling, and easy, which is always a winner. Easy is great. 
I had spread out some of the lemon zest onto a baking tray that I kept in a protected spot and I've kept on rotating it on that tray over a few days to dehydrate completely. It did take quite a few days, uh, but by this time it was all very dry and crispy, so I put it in a blender cup and ground it to a powder. The Thermomix will take it to a finer powder and I will probably do some of it in there when I go to use some of it in various things. Uh, I'll make a flavoured salt among other things but I also use some in the blueberry hot cross buns that I made to push that lemon flavour. I would really like to get to a point where I can have my dehydrator running most days but at the moment we just don't have the power feasibility to do that. It will probably need to sit on its own standalone system but a solar dehydrator build is on the cards too. It just keeps getting put off to get other stuff done but I would really like to be able to dehydrate, dehydrate and powder things that I can buy really cheap. I'm actually ordering some dehydrated and freeze dried fruits at the moment to use in some instant porridge mixes that I intend to make for the kids to use in food thermoses over the winter and to have been able to make my own would be great. But I have found some on special so cost wise it's not too bad, I just buy them when I see them. But to be able to do it would be ideal. I'd also like to make some instant powdered soups. The kids have been eating chicken noodle soup sachets that we got in one of the hampers for lunch quite regularly and I'd like to make my own version of that. Again dehydrated freeze-dried veggies would be really good for that. Uh, obviously we cannot run a freeze-dryer but we can figure out a way to run the dehydrator more consistently and with and when I can get things cheap and using it that way that would definitely be preferable so we'll see how we go. For brunch we had the leftover fried rice but this time I served it with some soft fried eggs over the top and I made up a batch of ketchup manis. Now I haven't been buying this because I figured out how to make it uh, but I haven't made any in a while because I've been a bit slack with doing that kind of stuff. So we didn't have any with dinner so I thought making it with brunch serving the serving that we had with brunch does that whole change of flavor thing with the same meal. It's basically soy sauce and sugar in almost equal amounts with add-ins if you want like garlic and ginger and that sort of thing and simmer it until it reduces by half and goes quite thick. It's really tasty. It's got that salty umami flavor but with the sweetness hit to it as well. It adds another whole layer to the fried rice. For dinner that night we had pizza. Karvik is normally my one to request pizza and he requests it far more than I actually make it, but that's fine. I did a same day yeasted dough because I just, as I said, I just seem to be struggling with the pre-planning of food at the moment. So I divided it up into eight pizzas once it had doubled on the bench and then put it in the fridge for the rest of the day to pull out when we were ready to cook pizzas for dinner. I cut up some of our homemade sausages as part of the toppings because we didn't have any chicken or anything out. So I sliced up and fried off the homemade sausages to put on top. I also fried off some of that shredded bacon that I had put in the silicon bags with it. Because the pizzas are cooked fairly quickly, being that I use the barbecue top pizza oven, I find that pre-cooking nearly all the toppings is fairly important to get good results. I don't seem to have gotten any footage of the pizza making. I think I was letting the kids help, but I remembered to put the camera on when I was cutting mine, which is the pizza to be, which is always the last pizza to be made and cooked. I use cheese on mine because I can, but I also make a flavorful mayo that everyone else uses as a bit of a cheese replacement on their pizza, and I quite like a drizzle of it as well. I tend to make it heavy on the cowboy candy and fermented garlic and that sort of thing because it adds to the pizza flavors and gives it a bit more of that umami flavor that cheese normally would. We have salami on there too, tin corn, the kids have pineapple, and some kids and Daryl have a mix of anchovies and marinated mushrooms as well. Uh, I make it to their requirements or choices of how they want them. So that was the next few days of food prep and everything else. We got most of the lemons and limes all sorted in that period of time. Uh, anything left was just used in bits and pieces after that. Uh, I think most of the bulk stuff is done by now and that the rest of the stuff is more I think there's one more video which might have some bulk stuff in it, but then the rest of it is more just our everyday making things work now. So now we have to work on just making everything that we have last for the next six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, however long it ends up being, uh, which is challenging in its own way. All that prep that we've done beforehand now makes it less prep heavy for the rest of the month but you also have more it also requires more planning and more prep and more decision making which is sometimes just as much work uh, but we will get there and I will show it all to you and we'll see how we go uh, as I said before it's hamper time next weekend so I'll probably get two hampers worth and we'll film that and we'll add that into that last couple of weeks of food as well which will help to stretch out some things there I don't know what the fruit and veg uh, options will be this month but hopefully we get some in there uh, and 
we'll just yeah we'll just work with what we've got uh daryl will have to go into toowoomba so if i really need him to get something he can get something at aldi or whatever if i ask him to though we try to avoid it because i try not to add those costs into the budget like by adding i still end up buying the same when i go and do my proper uh shopping so it means that we're just spending more in that month by spending more if that makes sense so if we can get by without it well that's that's how we stay in budget is by not going and buying those extra things so we'll see how we go but that was the next couple of days and i will see you on the next video thanks for joining me guys <laughs>